Isaiah chapter 9, very well known verses, are often read at this Christmas period. Just a couple of verses, if I may, that I'll try and uh, uh, centre my thoughts around this morning in regards to this wonderful idea of Advent, of the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very, very well known verses. Verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah 9. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Sure God will bless the reading of his word. Wonderful words. We've heard, all heard them read so many times, haven't we? But there's so many great truths in there. And I think sometimes it's not a bad thing to remind ourselves of these wonderful truths that we have in Scripture. And to me... It speaks of the two advents, the Lord Jesus Christ, his first advent that we think of at Christmas time, but also his second advent when we think of the Lord Jesus Christ coming again as the King in glory. Now the word advent, we throw it around quite easily, I'm sure most of you know, it actually means arrival, it comes from the Latin adventus, uh, and the Greek word for arrival is what I'm sure you Bible scholars will recognise, the Greek word is parousia, and that's sometimes a word that is applied to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to be fair, to be honest, the idea of Advent initially centred around the second coming of Jesus, not the first. It's only through the centuries uh, that as things developed within the church that the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as the baby in Bethlehem started to become part of the celebrations. And of course now it does tend to be a, a central part, this Advent weeks that we have leading up to Christmas Day. But originally it was the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that was thought of, his arrival as the King of glory. But I think in verses 6 and 7 that we have here in Isaiah 9, we can hopefully pick out both the Lord Jesus Christ's arrival, both of his advent. And I'd like to suggest, if I may, to keep it simple, verse 6 will use that to apply to the Lord Jesus Christ's first advent, what we're thinking of now at Christmas time. And then verse 7 will apply that to his second advent, when he comes again as the conquering Lord, as the King of glory. Verse 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Have you ever thought about that? Unto us a child is born. Why does the scripture emphasise that point? Well, let's not forget God is almighty. God can do anything. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did not need to come as a child. He did not need to come as a baby. He could have come in the, 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 the way of an angel. He could have come as a teenager. Or, just like the first Adam, like Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden. They weren't created as babies. They were created as adults. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, could have come the same way. Why not? Miss out all those years as a, as a child, as a teenager. Go straight into adult, adulthood. Go straight into the ministry. And off we go. That wasn't God's plan. That wasn't what God wanted to show to mankind. He wanted his son to be born as a child, to be born as a baby, so that he would experience all of human life, being born, living, and then dying. And if the Lord Jesus Christ had come in some other way, he wouldn't have experienced the full way of a human life, of being the real son of man, of knowing what people have to go through. And that's what God wanted him to experience, to go through. To be truly man and yet still God. So he could understand the human condition. And he could show how, even like that, he would show his great love for mankind. And isn't that a wonderful thing? That God planned it in that way, that Jesus accepted it in that way, to become as a child, as a baby. But there's another thought there, isn't there? When the Lord Jesus Christ comes as a baby, there's nothing more wonderful in this world than a little child, a little baby, is there? But what always scares me when, when my two were born and they, they were babies and these little things in your arms, how vulnerable they are. They rely completely on you as parents, as mum and dad, completely. Without the loving care of parents, the babies couldn't survive. They're so vulnerable 
And they're so weak. And they're helpless. And they need to be cared for and nurtured for, don't they? And I have to say, it's one of the most... Well, and I think other than meeting a Marion Dawn, of course, one of the most wonderful experiences in my life is, is parenthood. And having that responsibility and that privilege of caring for two human lives and seeing uh, Zach and Evie grow up into the young people that they are today. It's been a wonderful experience. But it's such a responsibility, isn't it? When you're given that little baby, mind the head. They don't bounce. Don't drop them. You've got to be so careful to look after them. And that's a wonderful comparison there. We've been singing there of the King of Glory, the God of Glory, and yet he came as a completely helpless, vulnerable baby. Philippians 2, when Paul writes that letter, yeah, you know it so well, he picks this up so well, where he said, the Lord Jesus Christ made himself nothing. Took the very nature of a servant. He took on human likeness and humbled himself. The Hebrew writer tells us that he was made a little lower than the angels. He gave it all up. The glory, the power, everything that he had, the worship that he received in heavenly realms. He gave it all up to be born as a child, to be born as a baby for me and you. The wonderful thing of creation is, sorry, the wonderful thing of the, the incarnation is that Paul reminds us again in Colossians 1 that in Jesus God wanted all his fullness to dwell in him. That he's before all things. And through him, God was going to bring back mankind. So this baby, although he could have everything, was so vulnerable and weak, he was still God. Isn't that wonderful? That he gave it all up and went to that human experience to be our saviour. And Paul reminds us that he's still the man who now mediates between us and God. Because he was born into human likeness. He was born as the son of man. Born as the, the, the son of God, yet man. And yet he's still in that same situation today as he stands before God and as he pleads our case. So isn't it wonderful to think that a child, that a baby is given. That was God's plan, that Jesus would experience all of life being a human, being, a human being. And he would give up everything just to be able to do that. A child is born, a son is given. It speaks of God giving his one and only son for mankind. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful gift the Lord Jesus Christ is. God wasn't forced into giving his son. God couldn't be made to give his son. It wasn't expected that God would give his son. He is God. He couldn't be persuaded by the angels to send the Lord Jesus Christ. None of it. It wouldn't work. He is God Almighty. And he decided in his great love for us to give us his son. Isn't that wonderful? That God would give his son for us. And let's not forget the the, the wonderful relationship between the father and the son. It's something as as a parent, as a grandparent, you can often pick up on that relationship you have uh, with your children, with your grandchildren. The Bible clearly tells us when the Lord Jesus Christ was baptised, when he was transfigured on that mountain there before his disciples, a voice from heaven came on both occasions and said, look, this is my son whom I love. He loved his son. They were so close. John 14 picks up this very well where Lord Jesus Christ says things like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you know me, you know the Father. I am in the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ knew that the words that he spoke came from the Father. John 14 again, verse 24 tells us that. And what he does His actions, they all come from the Father because he's doing the Father's will. They're so closely intertwined. Their relationship is so close. It's something you can't get between. And yet, that loving Father God gave his Son for you and for me. Isn't that wonderful? That's the gift that we've got to remember at Christmas time. When it says a son is given, it's God's Son. The Father God's Son who was given for us, for you and for me. He didn't have to. But because he loved us so much, that's what he did. And he gave his son as a baby, as a a man who would live and who would die for us on Calvary's cross. A child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Now ultimately, that will be fulfilled at the Lord's second coming. When he comes as conqueror, when he comes as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, when he takes over his creation once again and the whole universe and he rules with his perfect government. But this begins at his first advent. This begins, because if you go, if you go again into Philippians 2, and we refer to those wonderful words about Lord Jesus Christ, taking on the very nature of his servant, humbling himself, 
um, uh, becoming nothing. What does it say in verse 9 after those words? Therefore God exalted him in the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Therefore, because of what Jesus did at his first advent and he came, therefore God exalted him. So we can see that the government that God wants to have in this world through Jesus starts when the Lord Jesus Christ comes at his first advent, when he's born as the baby, when he as the son is given. That's why he's glorified. That's why he will get the ultimate authority and the glory that he is due. So it starts when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Interesting thought this about the government, about the government being on his shoulders and about his first coming, his first advent. How does that quite work? How can that quite gel? The Old Testament is, is a wonderful book of God. There's many truths in there that we can use to amplify and explain some things in the New Testament. And those of you who are aware of the, the high priest in the Old Testament, who was called, Aaron being the first high priest, the high priest was called to serve before God. And he was given special clothes to wear as he's serving before God. And one of the things he had to wear was a breastplate. And the breastplate was front and back. And one of the things that held his breastplate in place were things on his shoulders. And he had, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, epaulets or what you want to call them, but they had on his shoulders. On these epaulets, there were stones. And upon these stones, the 12 names of the tribes of Israel was inscribed, six on each shoulder. And that symbolises the government on the high priest's shoulders. How when the high priest was sacrificing, particularly on the Day of Atonement, paying for the sins of the people, he was doing it for the people. The government was on his shoulders. He was responsible for the people as he made the sacrifices for all the sins that they had made. That's the high priest. And that was given as a picture of our great high priest that Hebrews 9 speaks about. Our great high priest, Jesus, who didn't go into the, the, the tent or the tabernacle with the, 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 um, the temple with the bloods of goats and other animals and bulls. He went in with his own blood. And when did he do that? What did he have on his shoulder when he went to pay the price for us? He had a cross, didn't he? He was responsible for all people by going to the cross. And he bore that cross upon his shoulders as he went to Calvary there to pay this price for all of our sins as our great high priest. That's when his government starts. Because through getting salvation at Calvary with Jesus, you can have him in your life, governing, ruling your life in the way that he wants you to be and the blessings that that can give. And it all starts at Calvary when he shouldered that cross all the way to that hill where he was, where he was nailed upon and he was pierced. That's a wonderful thought to think. It all started when he came on his first advent. Because he came and was born so we could live and so we could die at Calvary as our great high priest. And there's a lovely little verse in Deuteronomy 33 which says this. The one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. Isn't that wonderful? God loves you and he rests you just like a shepherd. Puts a lamb between his shoulders to carry it to safety. So that's what Jesus did at Calvary. When he put his cross upon his shoulders he was showing how much he loved you. How much I want to take you into his government, under his control, and to give you his peace that is also spoken of here in Isaiah chapter 9. Isn't that wonderful to think about the son that was given, the child that was born, and the government being on his shoulders. Now we can see that pictured with the great high priest Jesus who died at Calvary. But he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Mighty God, Prince of peace. You know, in, in the scriptures, a name is not just something for identification. A name goes to the real essence of a person. It means something. It isn't just so you can call them, get all that person, get their attention. It really means something. And I like that because you may not be aware that the name David actually means absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, actually, the name David Jones means absolutely gorgeous. The name David Grover means something completely different. I just realised what I said then. But seriously, when a name is given, it's not just a tag, a tie, it's an identification. It goes to the very heart of who you are, of to what you will become. Now, some scriptures have a comma, wonderful, then counsellor. Some translations have wonderful counsellor, 
Take whichever one you fancy. It doesn't really matter. Because the wonderful adjective applies in either sense. Either he's wonderful or he's a wonderful counsellor. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which way you want to take it. If you take it as he's wonderful, that relates to what the things the Lord Jesus Christ did. Because in Luke it tells us, when he did things, the people wondered at what he'd done. When people saw Jesus, they were filled and overwhelmed with wonder. Because he taught with authority. He raised the dead. He did wonderful miracles. And he was a counsellor. We often speak of the Holy Spirit in John 14. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us about the counsellor that will come. And we always relate that to the Holy Spirit. And quite rightly so. But there's a word there that often I think many people miss. The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't say, I will send you a counsellor. What does he say? I will send you another counsellor. Check it out for yourself. The word is there. And why is it another counsellor? Because the counsellor that he is has already come. The one who is guiding and encouraging, who is uh, 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 reminding people, teaching people. That was Jesus himself. He was a counsellor already to his disciples, to the wider people who heard him. And we get his wonderful words and actions in our scripture so he can counsel us as well. And John picks up this thought again wonderfully in 1 John 2. Where he's, the idea of a counsellor is someone who stands in a court as a friend to help the accused, to defend their case. That's the counsellor that we've got who now stands before God. Isn't that wonderful? That he defends us before God now at this very moment. Not with what we've done, what we've said, but with his broken body and with his poured out blood. And to that defence there is no answer. That's the wonderful, the wonderful counsellor that we have. He's mighty God. Now some clever theologians try to, try to twist the word of God here and say, well of course, yes, Jesus is mighty because he's not actually fully God. Because only God is called Almighty. And they try to build a, a, uh, the wrong theology on that sort of idea. And let me tell you, they are wrong. They are so wrong. And they are quite simply wrong because of this. In Revelation 1, Jesus is called Almighty. So he is God. In Isaiah, in Isaiah 10, God himself is called Mighty. So to use their logic, God himself is not God. It's all rubbish. People use these ideas, these semantics, these word plays to try and prove their own theology. It's wrong. He is mighty God. He is almighty God. Jesus is God. Whatever anyone else wants to say. And he is a mighty God. And we were told there when Gabriel speaks to Mary, he reminds Mary, because she doubts what's going to happen to her bearing the Son of God. Gabriel reminds Mary that no word from God can fail. Because he's almighty. He is the mighty Father, the mighty God. All things are possible with God, is what Jesus tells us. Why? Because God is mighty. God is almighty. And Jesus is God. So whatever you read the words he's spoken in his scriptures, whatever you see he's done, these things cannot fail. Because all things are possible with God. That's the mighty God that we speak of that comes at this first advent. Everlasting Father. Some people get a bit confused. Well, how, will the, how can the Son be the Father? That's not the point. The point is, the Son acts like a father, like a parent, like a loving mother, like a loving father, like a loving parent, just as uh, many of us have had the privilege of doing so. You see, a parent, a father, protects and provides, gives everything they can for their children, guides them. More, but more than that, a parent loves their children. And we've already seen that how much God loves us by giving his son, how much Jesus loves us by dying on Calvary. And his love will be eternal. Just like as a parent, as a grandparent, our love just goes on and on. It doesn't matter what our kids do, whatever goes wrong in their lives, we still love them, don't we? Yes. And if we're sinners and we're human and we can do that, how much more was that love that comes from God will be everlasting? Just like a father. That's the way the door Jesus Christ loves us. And what did he say in John 10 again? I and the father are one. So as the father is everlasting and loves us, so he is just the same. And he will be called the prince of peace. The word there, prince, is an idea of a ruler. Someone who has authority. Someone who, in many senses, can have as much as authority as a king. Someone who goes ahead, who goes first, is the idea, the sense behind that word. And the thinking there is that uh, a prince is someone who's prepared to die for their king. Someone who will volunteer, is not forced, leads at the front and goes forward. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? He is the prince of peace. He goes first. As Colossians 1 says again, he's the first fruits, the firstborn. He goes first. And he comes at his first advent to do just that, to bring us peace. What did the angels say? At the first advent, when they brought the words to the shepherds, peace on earth, goodwill to all men, because they knew the Prince of Peace had been born and was going to bring peace 
to mankind. That's Isaiah verse 6, and you're all panicking now. You look at the clock thing, he's got verse 7 to go, yeah? Time's gone. Won't get to the second advent, I'm afraid. But maybe some other time I can share about the second advent from, chapter, from verse 7 of chapter 9. But for the Lord's will this morning, he just wanted me to speak on verse 6. So let's just think again what the Lord's trying to say to us this morning. He's saying to us that a child is born. That Jesus Christ came fully as man. So he could become the son of man who would die for us. And stand before God now to mediate for us as the man of God. His son is given. The father God gave his son so that we could live. The government is on his shoulders. And we see it started by the way he shoulders the cross to Calvary. And dies there at Calvary for us. That we can become part of his kingdom. We have our lives governed by him and his spirit. So the wonderful blessings that brings. And he will be called wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. He is the one who came at the first advent. And he is the one who will come at the second advent. But when he comes the second time round. He will come as the King of Glory. As verse 7 says there, his kingdom will be established, his government will be established. He will reign on the throne of David, establishing and holding it with justice and righteousness. Why? Because the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. God wants it to happen. God has willed that it will happen. As we think of the first advent this morning and the wonderful truths we see there, it points us to the second advent, the second coming of Jesus that will happen because the zeal of the Lord God Almighty wills that it should. Let's praise God this morning for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ who came. As we want this Christmas, his advent, advent time, let's praise and thank the Father for the son that he gave and the son for coming and for dying for us. And let's not forget, it points again to his second coming when he will come as the King of Glory. Amen. Amen. With that thought in mind, let's uh, close the service with Mission Praise 758. When the Lord in glory comes. Not the trumpets, not the drums, not the anthem, not the psalm. But his voice, when he appears, shall be music to my ears. What we'll do is we'll sing verses 1 and 3. Verses 1 and 3 of 758, standing to sing. Thank you very much indeed.